Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. Hi, this is Dr. Suzanne Sherman, Chief Medical Officer, DuPont. Very happy to welcome you to our second chapter of our fireside chat. Uh, today, we are talking about the lasting impact of COVID-19 on the cardiovascular system. So uh, we hope you find this information helpful and um, informative. Well, one of the things that I thought that uh, one of the things that you should know about today's event um, is uh, regarding the American Heart Association. Uh, we're very, very grateful for the sponsorship of the American uh, Heart Association um, and uh, because there is a, a relationship. DuPont is supporting the Heart Walk through a signature uh, sponsorship this year on November the 7th. So I'll be there looking for all of you. Uh, so please get your sneakers out this summer and get ready to walk next November. A key part of this sponsorship, however, uh, is uh, that the American Heart Association is working with DuPont to focus on improving overarching heart health of DuPont employees through these educational sessions. And we're hoping that these sessions will offer important information on how to improve heart health, prevent stroke, as well as engage employees in new ways that will lead to improved physical and mental health. So please keep watching. Um, later this summer, uh, we're going to have a session called Life Simple Se 7, again, an AHA-sponsored, uh, uh, supported event, uh, where we will bring information to you about the seven ways of improving heart health, including nutrition and physical activity. Late, later in the summer, mental health and heart disease, and towards the fall, diversity and heart disease, talking about heart disease in women. So with that, I'm very pleased. Uh, it's an honor to welcome Dr. Sandra Weiss. Pleasure welcome to be here. Thank you so much. Dr. Weiss is board certified uh, in general and interventional cardiology. Uh, she is a medical director at the Cardiac ICU at Christiana Care, where she's an active member of the interventional cardiology staff. Uh, Dr. Weiss has special interests in both coronary and peripheral interventions and is an active participant in the multidisciplinary critical limb ischemia program at Christiana. She was integral in implementing and developing radial artery uh, catheterization, a procedure that reduces complications and improves patient satisfaction and survival during coronary intervention procedures. Among Dr. Weiss's numerous awards and honors are the Internal Medicine Departmental Award and the American Medical Women's Association Award, both received at the University of Chicago. She has published several peer-reviewed articles and abstracts and is an active fellow of the American College of Cardiology. Again, welcome, Dr. Weiss. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So, Dr. Weiss, you know, we're going to jump into the, the COVID topics momentarily, but you know, what, what inspired you to go into medicine? As we were chatting earlier, uh, I had a natural leaning towards science and math. I was that strange college kid who actually enjoyed organic chemistry. Um, and it was a natural leaning towards something in the sciences. And then I was further inspired by just my parents' own illnesses and watching them go through that and just being early on engendered by the medical community, um, having seen them go through their own illnesses early on in life. And absolutely. And, and so you've studied at highly regarded institutions in both Boston and Chicago. What brings you to Delaware? It was a circuitous route. Uh, I was <laughs> looking for uh, jobs at the peak of the market and um, of the market crash. And my husband, who is also a physician, was interviewing in a lot of the metropolitan cities where interventional cardiology jobs were far and few between. Mm. And um, it was at an interview at CHOP that they suggested that I consider Christiana. And ah. up until that time, for a girl from the Midwest, Delaware wasn't even on the map. Oh um, it soon became very much a part of my map because uh, Christiana was, um, just a almost like an oasis in the desert it was it was really a truly wonderful place it had everything i was looking for and i am inspired by my team every day oh my goodness you know when looking back over the pandemic people have been through so much over the past 15 months and i'm sure you are not uh you know there's no difference for you so i'm sure 
being a physician working in the ICU, you must have been through incredible highs and lows during this very challenging period. Absolutely. Well, first, it was incredible to see how the hospital system rallied. And it was inspiring to see, especially those in the front, front line, my yeah. ER colleagues and right. my ICU and hospitalist colleagues who literally were in the face of COVID every day right. and facing it with uh, fearlessness and grace and also amalgamating with the team of frontline providers and establishing those connections with those people um, was truly inspiring. Um, and it was funny that there were moments that I wouldn't expect that would make me emotional. <laughs> and it was, it was situations like, of course, when I got my vaccine or when my husband got his vaccine that the tears came because yeah. it was, it was a release. Um, but I remember early on in the pandemic that I became a little misty when I saw the, that little sticker that they put on during yeah. the oil change. Yeah. They yeah. say your next oil change at, you know, 13,000 yeah. miles. Yeah. And, yeah. and the, the person who did the oil change said, be safe. And it was a little moment like that, that really just sort of brought to the forefront how emotionally charged that situation is and how you have to put on the veil of toughness every day and go at it, you know, with your head down. And um, that somebody else was noticing even in that small way was, uh, was really a very emotional experience. You know, I, I think it's important that you, that you share how emotional COVID has been. Mm -hmm. And I imagine that many people had that moment you know, just that, that moment, you keep it all in, and then there's that moment, and it's just, you realize what everybody has been through mm -hmm. and how horrible it, it has mm -hmm. been at times. Mm -hmm. has, has the pandemic changed you? Well, I should have bought stock in hand sanitizer because <laughs> I know for sure that um, that is definitely something I'm just more conscious and careful about my own level of, um, you know, just hand washing and we were always careful about it before but it's uh, you know I, I don't have skin on the back of my hands anymore because I'm using hand sanitizer so much but um, on a more serious note it's we always appreciated the small things mm -hmm. but now even more that mm -hmm. appreciating the little things the time with my family yes and recognizing how blessed my own family was at being able to avoid major illness and losses you know, things that a lot of families around the world can't say and um, yeah. just appreciating those finer moments. Horrible. So with all of this now behind you and life in front of you, what are your goals, Dr. Dr. Weiss? Well, uh, you know, as you mentioned, I'm the medical director of our cardiac ICU and I want to professionally be working on continuing to build that team. Um, but personally, it's always been important to me to continue to find work-life balance. I'm the mom to an eight and a half year old and he's busy and trying to continue to have that balance to be both professionally good at my job but also personally good at my job yeah. um, is, is really a very huge goal for me to continue to work, work, work on. A lot of work for all of us to do in, in, yes. in, in that direction. Um, so, you know, let's talk about COVID a little bit. We, you know, so many people think about it primarily as a, as a uh, disease of the lungs. And it's, you know, it's been with us now for a year and a half. Um, do you, you know, tell us about how it impacts the heart? Because I don't know that a lot of people think about the heart. I think some people have connected a little bit mm -hmm. um, because they heard about the ACE channels and all of that. And they mm -hmm. think, well, I take a, you know, Lipitor, that's an ACE inhibitor. So maybe there's something to do. But can you talk a bit about, you know, how COVID impacts the heart? Absolutely. What we know is that COVID can both directly and indirectly impact the heart. There's the sense that the heart is a muscle and when the muscle is under stress, it in and of itself can experience strain the same way a bicep tires when you're lifting dumbbells, the heart can do the same. Hmm. And when you have uh. this major weight of this very profound illness, even if primarily pulmonary, the heart is going to experience the stress and has secondary ramifications 
from that experience. There is ev absolutely evidence of laboratory abnormalities that can be recognized, both sort of a mild as well as a more extreme case um, that signal a heart attack, but we can talk about that a yeah. little bit more in right. the future. Right. But the um, future effects of COVID, people are being left with not only pulmonary long-term effects, but they're being left with um, cardiovascular long-term effects, hypertension, high blood pressure. That they is, didn't have before. That they didn't have before wow. is up. Um, oh. And the <clears throat> incidence of clotting disorders and the use of not only blood pressure medications, but blood thinners yeah. is up. There are lipid abnormalities that wow. result, maybe because people are not exercising or seeking medical care, um, but we're seeing a lot more diabetes, even in the short term follow-up period that yeah. we're seeing the incidence of these disorders escalating, not to mention the fact that COVID in and of itself is a pro-coagulant state, which means right. you're more likely to develop blood clots. Yes. So there were problems with increased blood clots of the legs and of the lungs, but also of the heart. And we were seeing that people who had had COVID were coming in with your standard garden variety heart attacks in people who otherwise would likely not have had that happen. So to them. They, they didn't necessarily have narrowing of the arteries based on, let's say, a buildup of cholesterol in the walls, but it was that clotting that was going on. And well, and they worked in tandem because you would need to have some sort of nidus with that atherosclerotic buildup. Right, right. But the pro clotting factors that COVID tended to predispose to certainly lended itself to increased incidence of these of these cardiovascular events. That's so, so do you, do you, did you note that, I mean, I know that your focus is, uh, you know, in the ICU, but are patients with cardiovascular disease more at risk for the more serious aspects of COVID-19? Absolutely. What we have found is that there are certain cardiovascular risk factors that make you more likely to have worse outcomes with COVID, okay. hypertension, a history of cardiovascular disease in the form of heart attack, and those with history of heart failure tended to have worse outcomes. There's this very profound um, cytokine effect, which basically means that as we are coming out of the COVID acute illness, people can develop this very pro-inflammatory state that causes their heart muscle to become weakened and they develop shock, which is low blood pressure right. and often need support in the form of ICU care, medicines to support blood pressure, and sometimes even devices to support the heart. And those patients who had these cardiovascular conditions going into their COVID diagnosis were more likely to have these kind of outcomes and ultimately die because of it. So even somebody, let's say, with metabolic a metabolic disorder, you know, there, there are folks that are watching their blood sugar mm -hmm. and hoping, well, gee, 105 doesn't mean anything, 120 doesn't mean anything, and they haven't lost uh, those 40 pounds. Those folks were at extra risk for COVID, sounds like. They were. Um, oh. uh, those with diabetes were amongst those that were at higher risk of developing these poor outcomes and uh, more severe disease. Wow, absolutely. And, and so can COVID cause heart impacts even in people that aren't hospitalized? I mean, even if they have a so-called mild case of, of COVID? It's an interesting question. And some of the answer to that is that we're not sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, there was a very interesting study that looked at people who were not hospitalized and okay. theoretically were not considered severe. And they did MRI studies on these on these people three months after, on average, their COVID diagnosis. And the MRI studies were actually abnormal in over half of them. Wow. In other words, that there was some evidence of swelling and inflammation in small patchy areas of the heart that may or may not have been related to COVID. It's hard to know for sure. Um, but there's certainly some suggestion that even with mild cases of disease, there could be some lasting ramifications on the heart. There was definitely evidence that people who had more significant illnesses were going to be the ones impacted with blood pressure issues and increased use of cholesterol medications and incident diabetes. Right. Right. Um, 
that is more likely with more severe disease. Okay. But where we end up, I think only time will tell. Yep. I'll have to keep watching. So, you know, I'm just so glad that you're here today because, I, again, I, I think a lot of people think about COVID as an issue with the lungs or not thinking about the heart. Um, and now, you know, we're at a point 15 months later, people are beginning to get vaccinated. We're turning the curve. I think heard on the news this morning, we were at the lowest point that we've been in just since like last early last summer uh, in, in the United States. And of course, there are places in the world like India where that's not the case and, and it's raging and quite horrible at this point in time. But speaking of vaccines, you know, one of the things that caught my eye uh, was a study, I think it was from uh, related to a couple places, uh, uh, both in Israel and also I think the U.S. Army had perhaps noted some concerns about the Pfizer vaccine mm -hmm. causing myocarditis or inflammation mm -hmm. of the heart. What, what have you seen about, can you help us understand Absolutely. that? Absolutely. So the number of cases that reported the potential for myocarditis was 62 out of this Israeli network. Right out of more than five million people that were vaccinated. It certainly is curious, but it's hard when you're dealing with a self-reporting system right. because anything that could have otherwise happened gets reported right. and it's hard to know if it's connected to the vaccine. The risk of developing myocarditis, 62 and five million is 0.001%, which is on the order of the cerebral clots that we saw with the J&J &J vaccine. Right. But at the same time, 3 million people will develop myocarditis annually. Anyway. And so are they related or is it true, true and unrelated? We're just looking at these people mm -hmm. so carefully. Exactly. Uh, I myself, actually, I was a volunteer for one of the studies mm -hmm. Um, and I found out after the fact that, you know, that I received the, the uh, placebo uh, and that was fine. But, you know, I am aware, you know, they're, they're, I have a, my phone goes off every three days asking me, how are you feeling? How are right. you feeling? Because they're following people mm -hmm. longitudinally. And as you said, that doesn't happen in normal life. Absolutely. Someone's asking you three times a week, how do you feel? Um, so, you know, when you, when you, based on what you've seen and when people have severe COVID disease, do they, can they recover? I mean, have you, have you witnessed recovery? Absolutely. Um, the majority of people will recover. The, the chance of developing really severe illness, ICU level illness is less than 5%. Okay. But those that do develop severe illness typically will require time to get back to what they were. There's- Is it like a six month or so you thinking more of a year, years? Uh, hard to know, simply okay. because I think that the the long haul phenomena is still being borne out in our observations at this point. Yeah. The long haul phenomena being the ongoing shortness of breath and fatigue and cardiovascular symptoms that people can experience um, it, long after their COVID has recovered. And there's actually guidance um, from the cardiology communities and the medical communities in general about when is it safe to return to play. And typically people who have mild illness can return after a 10 day period of rest, as long as they do not have any residual symptoms beyond the typical URI stuffiness, mm -hmm, right. even loss of taste or smell, as long as the more serious symptoms of the shortness of breath and cough and congestion in the chest, as long as that's recovered, most people can return with graded, gradual increases in exercise. The people who have more significant illness, who either required oxygen, were hospitalized, required ICU level care intubation, mm -hmm. um, where you had to be placed on a ventilator, the time course is much more prolonged you typically want to assess them after they're out of the hospital and do provocative testing to see whether or not there are high risk features that would predispose them to bad cardiovascular outcomes in the future. Those things include laboratory assessments, EKGs and ultrasounds of the heart. Mm -hmm. And if there's none of those, we still say four to six weeks of ongoing 
symptom recovery, mm -hmm. and then a reassessment. Mm -hmm. If any of those things are abnormal, you're being referred to a specialist because trying to engage in activity again could potentially lead to increased risk for bad rhythm problems that could increase your risk of dying. And are the regular tools that one would use, the stress testing and all that, predictive? I mean, are you able to use them the same way that we typically would look at a stress test and double products and all that? Or has that gone out the window a bit? With, so typically, with yes. If there are no evidence of lab abnormalities, EKG abnormalities, or ultrasound abnormalities, the chance of having lasting cardiovascular impact that would preclude you from going back to a normal life, um, those things are in your favor, that you should be able to go back to what you previously were doing. You may not get there in two weeks, um, but you can eventually get there in time. I want to come back to something you said a couple of minutes ago. You are talking about oxygen demand. Can you talk about you know the whole dynamic of oxygen demand and COVID and, and what's happening sure. when somebody's you know dreadfully ill and, and in the ICU? Absolutely. Thank you. As I mentioned, the heart is like any other muscle. If yeah. we're regular people running six miles, the muscles of the legs get tired. Right. And it's because we are taxing those muscles. The muscle is asking for more oxygen to continue its activity. Okay. And sometimes we're not able to provide the amount of oxygen required and our muscles fatigue. Okay. The same thing happens with the heart. The heart is a muscle. It is fed by its own set of blood vessels. And when the demand of the heart to keep on pumping blood everywhere in the body is higher than the ability for the body to provide the heart in its, of itself its own blood flow, you end up having a supply-demand mismatch Problem. if you okay. think about in economic terms. Yeah. And the heart can struggle. It can weaken. It can have even death of some of the heart muscle cells that can lead to these lab abnormalities that are seen when patients come into the hospital. Because it, it, the heart's just working so hard. The heart is working so hard. Oh and gosh. if you have blockages to start, the ability for the heart to maximize its blood flow is already impinged upon because the blood vessels themselves are diseased. Right. So the right. risk of having these, um, these heart cells die and therefore leading to these lab abnormalities and the weakening of the heart muscle is higher than in someone who doesn't have predisposing blockages. Wow. You know, I got to know Christiane originally when I came to Delaware related to ECMO. Uh, you know, we had an interest in making sure and visited actually your unit at that point in time. And I remember reading that there were actually some COVID patients that had to go on ECMO, uh, ECMO being a a kind of a heart-lung machine mm -hmm. uh, for short periods of time because of exactly what you were talking about. It's an experience that is really very devastating. You have to be on the brink to okay. really be at that point. Yeah. And that was reserved for patients who really had severe heart muscle dysfunction, either because of the severity of the acute illness, but sometimes there were patients who developed heart muscle dysfunction above and beyond this supply demand mismatch in thought because they developed inflammation from myocarditis, wow. possibly related to direct invasion of the heart muscle by the virus itself, although it's not been definitively shown. But there are definitely cases where inflammation is found at the level of the heart muscle when biopsy samples were taken, right. although that was a very small number of patients where right. they actually went that far to take heart muscle samples. You know, Dr. Weiss, you, you mentioned as we were chatting earlier that you're a mother of a small child and just thinking about how your day shifts, you know, from what you're seeing in the ICU and going home, you know, to your child and, you know, back and forth and back and forth. Wearing both hats, that must have been particularly difficult. Is there a perspective that, that you would share based on that kind of shifting from, from this, this, this horror to you know, to, to, to home life and being a mom. Well, pros and cons. The pro being that there was always a sense of normalcy when I would walk in the front door. My son would still want to go out in the backyard and throw the baseball around. And when I would be at work, we would be in the face of all these devastating illnesses. So it provided a little bit of normalcy, but it was also very anxiety provoking. And I 
was, although in the front line, not in the front front line, because I saw COVID directly less frequently than some of my ER and ICU colleagues did. Yeah. Um, but every day you were wondering what you were bringing home. Yeah. And I got into the habit of changing my scrubs before I left the hospital. The shoes were left in the garage. You would shower upon entry to the home. And now we sort of realize that you can relax that a little bit. But early on, it was very oh, stressful horrifying. to think about what you could be bringing into the home and exposing your family to. Oh, absolutely. My um, when my elder son, uh, eldest son, potted with me for several months during the crisis. And, you know, we had this whole routine of packages arrived at the front door and we turned on the ventilator. We had a, not a ventilator, but we had an air purifying device mm -hmm. sitting at the front door and masks on. And that had to run for 15 minutes before anybody would open up the mail. And I mean, it just, it just went on and on. So now we have the vaccine. Yes. And we're just, you know, there's a huge sense of, of relief that there's, you know, hope in sight mm -hmm. and things are being opened up and, and there's some normalcy. And now we're even hearing that the Pfizer vaccine is approved for emergency use authorization mm -hmm. for 12 to 15 year olds. Your perspective on that? I think it's fantastic. Um, I think yeah. that anything that will help promote kids getting back to school. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Is a win in my book yeah. because the non-COVID impact of children not being in school will yeah. have long lasting ramifications that I think will be far more devastating to them than COVID ever will be. And I think we were hearing locally that some of the school districts were offering the opportunity to repeat the year even, um, you know, just recognizing that, which maybe that will help some children. Absolutely. And I give Great credit to the teachers and educators who have had to flex in such dramatic way to virtual learning and the children who have been able to flex equally. Um, I'm excited that my son is back four days a week and hoping that it'll right. get to five. And if ultimately some of the small pockets of outbreaks that we see in the junior high and high school level can be mitigated by this age group getting vaccinated, right. I think that's extremely impactful and powerful to try to get these kids back on track. It's like 20% of the population uh, in, in that age group, so it's going to make a huge amount of difference. You know, as, as you talk about uh, what pe people have been through, you know, as I look out at the audience uh, and just thinking about all that you've been through, you know, those of you that work from home uh, and had, you know, your living room turned into schoolroom and it was your workplace and you know everything else so um, everybody please give yourself a pat on the back for even Absolutely. Getting, getting through all that um, I, I'm the mother of mine are generation Y you know, they're not uh, you know the 15 year olds anymore they're 30 years old uh, at this point in time and it's been interesting having an interesting conversation about the vaccine mm -hmm. I couldn't believe it you know I'm thinking oh I'm a doctor this won't happen well it did you know that that I had the generation wires saying oh no I'm healthy why should I worry mm -hmm. and I said okay let's go back <laughs> to talk about this. Uh, so we've had some very serious conversations at home and I finally had to say, okay folks, you're 30 years old. Would you like to take care of me? So you know, let's look at how you're going to take care of your parents. Could you please get the vaccine? And, and that's what we needed to, mm -hmm. to do to kind of turn things around a little bit because I know there are a lot of folks out there that are thinking, well, it's nothing more than a cold or it's not all that serious. And maybe for many young people, it wasn't so bad, mm -hmm. but yet, uh, you know, it, for some young people, it was very bad. Absolutely. And young people died um, as, as a function of COVID. Friends and colleagues. Oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. That, that have died. Um, and then we saw Miss C, the, for the, sure. the, um, the multiple inflammatory syndrome in children. With the, children are an interesting subset because only 15% of people tested positive were children. And only about 2%, 2 to 3% end up with severe illness. Severe illness meaning that they required oxygen right. and a hospitalization. Um, typically, children who had predisposing conditions, diabetes, immune, um, immune deficiencies, they were the children premature 
uh, history of prematurity, they were the children that tended to get sicker and get hospitalized. Now, whether or not they ended up with severe disease or people were having more precautious treatment of them, it's a little hard to know, um, but a real minority of children ended up on ventilators and an even smaller minority ended up dying from COVID. The MIS-C phenomena, which is thought to be a post-infectious inflammatory phenomena that resembles Kawasaki, yeah, right. um, although with its own sort of unique variants, that happens less than 1% of the time. It was highly reported because it was unique and very prominent in the sense that it was, it was a, an outlier. Right. And so people recognized it as an outlier, but it was highly reported. But I want to remind everybody that it's exceedingly rare. Yeah. And most children fare very well with COVID. Only about, uh, actually a third of them are asymptomatic. Now, whether or not they can transmit, there's thought to be some minor transmission amongst households and in the school uh, in the school setting. But most of the time, school transmission occurred when improper social distancing or masking yeah. were in place. Okay. If we've learned internationally that if we take the right precautions, kids typically are not the vectors that they were that we were afraid they might be. Oh. And so it's uh, a unique perspective um, that in some ways COVID was life-saving for children because with the measures in place, they weren't coming in with their RSV. They weren't coming in with their bronchiolitis. They weren't coming in with influenza. I see. And I see. so the number of children who were in ICUs typically was far less because they were not exposed to these other things that typically would be high of morbidity and mortality. I think it brings up some interesting questions, you know, as we face the question about continuing to mask, mm -hmm. you know, that, that yes, we were protected from COVID, but we were also protected from other things. Mm -hmm. And for children, as you're saying, some of those things are deadly, mm -hmm. actually. So, so, you know, looking back, looking at where we are right now, um, you know, COVID has been so much in the news, we've tended to forget about some of those other diseases that, that drive morbidity and mortality. Is it correct to say that heart disease is still number one? That still should be our number one concern. Absolutely. The number of people who became very sick or died from COVID is huge compared to our annual averages of other infectious diseases. So I cannot underscore the importance of that enough. But we can't forget that cardiovascular disease is still the number one killer. And the fact that people have not been exercising, they've not been outdoors, Many of my outpatients are coming in with weight gain and worsening diabetes control, worsening blood pressure control because they have not been active. They have not been caring for themselves, rightfully out of fear of going to the gym and even being amongst others. Um, but now that we are seeing the light of day, the encouragement that we need to provide our patients about doing right by themselves couldn't be more important. Absolutely. And so this means even for people that didn't have COVID and in weren't impacted one way or the other, they were likely impacted because they didn't get off the sofa. Mm -hmm. They sat there for hours and hours and talked. They got out of their normal routines, Absolutely. whatever those routines were. Well, it's hard because now that we are in a virtual world, you can go a whole day on Teams meetings. Yes, you can. And not can get up from your it. chair. And yes. so yes. it is going to be interesting to see how we as a society now integrate the virtual world into what we previously had been, which was largely non-virtual, and we, how we can sort of express the importance of making sure that diet and exercise are even more important than they were before yeah. because of the virtual phenomena. You know, I, I find myself, uh, I was one of those people that worked from home for the 15 mm -hmm. months, except lately when we've been giving vaccines, of course, and so I came back in here to the X station and uh, to do that. But, um, you know, I, over, on the weekends when I would go to the office at Chestnut Run for mail, I found myself treasuring that walk up from the parking lot. 
And, and you know, I look at my watch and think, you know, some days at home, you could not, you know, I didn't walk more than a thousand steps. And that, when I discovered that, I was very startled and said, this is just not okay. You know, mm -hmm. this has got to get fixed. So I'm looking forward to getting back to work because it's, it's got a baked in 4,000 steps to just back and forth and up and down and, mm -hmm. you know, all of that. I mean, I'm looking at exercise as a gift. Uh, I didn't think of it as a gift, but it really is. Not only for physical health, but also mental health. So important. Because one of the the secondary impacts is the impact on mental health. Yes. Not only for those who had COVID, but for those who didn't. And yes. the anxiety that people all over the world had over the what if. It, yeah, I mean, just, and the horror that they were dealing with. Well, I see we're getting some interesting questions coming in from Slido, so let's see if we can go to some of those. So. Um, I'm, let's go to the first question. Recent research shows that the SARS-CoV spike protein impairs endothelial function via downregulation of ACE2. Can you tell that you're at a science-based uh, yeah, company? Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> okay. uh, how can we be sure that this, the vaccine spike protein won't do the same thing? So there was a lot of initial concern about ACE2 being one of the receptors that the SARS virus uh, utilized in order to enter a cell. Um, and there was initially some concern about ongoing use of ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers as fairly standard antihypertensive medications and whether or not it would up or down regulate the ability for the virus to get into cells and replicate. And this was actually not borne out in, yeah. Yeah, on the bench. Yeah. And so we as a cardiology community and the general medical community continue to encourage the use of these medications. Now, there is certainly an impact on endothelial function, but whether it has more to do with inflammation that the virus tends to upregulate versus the virus itself at this point is not entirely clear but likely more related to the former, because as I mentioned, when biopsy samples are taken, we've never clearly demonstrated that the virus itself is in the sites that are inflamed. Um, hmm. So it's more of a systemic inflammation. So likely the spike protein, um, it's such a small component of it that it's unlikely to cause the impact that the question is uh, asking about. But it's it, an interesting question, absolutely. Um, any insight, are you reading or seeing anything in terms of when vaccines will receive full approval in instead of the uh, emergency use authorization? Well, I know and the companies are very interested in getting full approval yeah. uh, for a multitude of reasons of because course. it'll be more easily distributed um, and uh, you could advertise and provide you know, better impact to the community at large that way. The EUA was uh, supported because of the emergency nature with relatively shorter time period of outcomes data. Typically a vaccine is gonna take six to 12 months before full approval because you want to have six months worth of outcomes data before they get full approval. We were working on two. Um, I know that both companies, you know, Pfizer has already submitted for full approval and Moderna was hotly on the tails of that. Um, and so it could still take several months before the full approval yeah. is reached, but typically it's because you want to have six months of outcomes data before that can be garnered. And, and I thought that, you know, the, the uh, scientific documentation that was submitted, at least even, even what was released to the public, uh, was significant. Absolutely. Uh, in, in terms of what the FDA required to even release the, these vaccines for emergency use authorization. So to give them full approval, you know, there's, as you said, they need more time. And I know some of the vaccine hesitancy had to do with the rapidity that the authorization was, how, how rapid they got the authorization. But one thing that's different about this, these vaccines compared to others is that the entire world was working yeah. on nothing but this vaccine and yeah. these vaccines for a concentrated period of time. There was a worldwide interest and so much effort went into 
getting the data and taking this vaccine to the finish line that, um, you know, our, our safety data is certainly there. Absolutely. Uh, you know, the other thing that I found interesting was that the work that led up to these revolutionary vaccines, the genetic vaccines, for example, had been going on for a number of years. For about uh, a decade. A decade. Mm -hmm. and, and so those of you out there, if you haven't already seen the GROW series, uh, the GROW series uh, was a, an educational series that was brought forward by our business division, ENI. Uh, and so they actually... Uh, presented some information about the developers, you know, the, the, the two researchers that got together at the University of Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. you know, one being a vaccine specialist and the other one being a specialist in, in genetic uh, vaccines and uh, came together. So a lot of this work has been ongoing for years before, fortunately, before need, you know, before mm -hmm. we actually got to the pandemic. We have a question that's come in about uh, the whether or not diet can reduce the effects of SARS-CoV. Uh, we've got a couple of folks uh, asking about the Caldwell Estelin Colin Campbell uh, uh, studies uh, related to diet, any related to coronary artery disease. I'm not familiar with that work. I'm actually not familiar with that work either. Uh, so I apologize to uh, the person who posed the question. Diet can always impact coronary disease. Um, whether or not it can do so in the acute is hard to know. There's some suggestion that vitamin deficiencies, specifically vitamin C and vitamin D, can increase yeah. your potential for severity. Right. Um, but whether or not supplementing with this or eating a diet that's high in these sorts of minerals may or may not have any long lasting impact on the severity of COVID. The, the three folks that sent in that question, please email that research to me if you would, uh, and I'll share it with Dr. Weiss. We'd be interested in knowing more about that. Um, another question that's come in, looks like it's got a lot of interest here, is uh, as fully vaccinated people follow the new demasking, uh, demasking guidelines, what's your advice for masks in children less than 12? Well, we face that exact question ourselves, yeah. and w my husband and I, as fully vaccinated people, feel comfortable with being um, in line with the CDC guidance and demasking in the appropriate positions. However, children are still subject to getting sick. I think their risk of getting seriously sick is low, so in appropriate situations such as outdoor sports where simply being outside, which reduces your risk of transmission, but also where social distancing is easier to do. Masking may or may not be necessary. I think it has to do with your own personal level of comfort. I know that in situations where my son is still gonna be subject to masks, my husband and I, out of solidarity, will continue to wear our masks. Yeah, yeah. Not so much because we're afraid for ourselves, but more because we recognize that he is still at risk. And even though his risk of serious illness is small, we don't necessarily wanna take that chance. Well, I mean, you know, I mean, you're, you've chosen to share that you're vaccinated, I'm vaccinated, we're at six feet distance, and you know, doing all the right things, but yet if your child was here, you know, I would, I absolutely would put my mask back on because sure. I think there is a question of civility. There is a question mm -hmm. of the social order that we've got to think about uh, that, you know, the individual that's vaccinated knows that they're vaccinated, but we do have to think about those that cannot yet be vaccinated, such as children and setting the right example. So it, it, it's a little difficult. It can be a little confusing, you know, the government saying you can be demasked, but yet perhaps, you know, in a social setting, in a work setting, where we don't know who is and who isn't, mm -hmm. you've got to keep, you know, you've got to do the right thing. And, and that's one of the choices we made here at DuPont to uh, recommend that people continue to wear the masks for now. We'll mm -hmm. continue to reevaluate. But mm -hmm. it, it gets to that same sort of question of setting the right example and civility uh, related to those that may not have been vaccinated. Um, are you concerned about the potential long-term effects the vaccines may have on our bodies? No, I am not, um, in part because the way that, especially the mRNA vaccines work is that they don't incorporate into the DNA. Right. So it's simply telling the body, this is abnormal, make an antibody to attack this abnormal protein. And it's only part of the protein that it's showing the body. It's not incorporated into the cells, and so I think that there's a lot of safety data there. 
J&J &J works a little bit differently, but still the safety data is certainly there. Um, there has not been large scale evidence of long-term side effects. Of course, we'll need to continue to follow, but the efficacy certainly for me outweighs the potential risks of the vaccine. So you're talking about some of the clot issues that uh, came about, the concerns with those viral vectored vaccines, the J&J &J and mm -hmm. the AstraZeneca Absolutely. coming to mind. Yeah. Although again, is it because of self-reporting and they would right. have been there in the background anyway, but we just happen to connect them because everybody's reporting right. on the millions of cases who, of people who have been vaccinated. And you know, I also wondered about like Gam Gamalea. Uh, which is the Russian-made vaccine, and they didn't have similar reports. So, uh, you know, wondering how in the world, you know, why was that? But I agree with you, the, the, the risk of those very, very serious but rare events was just so rare mm -hmm. that it, it really doesn't detract from Absolutely. the great value that these vaccines bring in avoiding the kind of pain and suffering that you've been describing for us this morning. And there's always press about fertility issues and change in menstrual cycles and what that might do for especially adolescent age people who could get the vaccine, there's really not any evidence that it does any of that. And so I fully encourage the community to vaccinate where appropriate. Absolutely. Okay, um, and he, this is a question one of my colleagues had asked me this one several months ago, correlation between blood types and severity of COVID. Potentially, um, it is a signal but never been totally borne out. So it's, uh, it's an interesting nugget, but I don't think that we necessarily say that if you're blood type A, you're doomed to have more severe COVID. There's plenty of all the blood types who have gotten severe COVID. I, you know, I wondered whether it was a co-founder. I wondered, you know, wonder whether it was a, uh, whether it was one of those factors that kind of traveled along mm -hmm. uh, that you have, uh, you know, I'm type A, uh, blood type A, and you find that a lot in some African-American people mm -hmm. as well. And so I was thinking, okay, is it, you know, because of this, these socioeconomic factors that are traveling along, uh, with the COVID uh, pandemic that mm -hmm. there's a suspicion about blood type when really what we're looking at is a socioeconomic phenomenon. Time will tell. We'll just have to see what happens with that. But when I heard about the, the type A <laughs> relationship, I thought, okay, one more reason to uh, keep washing those hands and, <laughs> and uh, not touching the mail. Someone said, good morning, good morning to you. Uh, for those that were infected with COVID-19 and have antibodies present in their system, when should they receive the vaccine? Really as soon as possible. Um, the, the current guidance is different than what initially existed. Some would say that you wanna wait for 90 days because theoretically that would, went, that would be when the natural antibody response would have waned. Um, but now the guidance is to get vaccinated as soon as possible. Now, whether or not that means you'll have a more robust immune response to the, the first or second dose of the vaccine is hard to say. We've anecdotally seen that those who had COVID before tend to have more of the viral-like symptoms after their first dose, whereas mm -hmm. those who didn't tended to get it after their second. And that's because the second dose already has a primed immunity that is exacerbated and heightened right, by exposure right. to the second dose. A very interesting question, that last one that came up, because, you know, as I mentioned, we've been giving vaccines here at the X station, also down at our plant uh, down at uh, Bellevue, at Myops up in Michigan, as, you know, Myops is our uh, Michigan-based plant uh, as, as well. Um, and so, you know, it, it just sort of, it sort of, you know, makes you wonder exactly, you know, what's what's happening with that. Um, so we've got there are tens of thousands of women who've reported extraordinarily heavy periods with extreme clotting. What are your thoughts on this? Uh, I don't think that it's the same sort of clotting yeah. that we would be concerned about with the COVID um, infection, usually that kind of clotting is venous clotting, not necessarily related to menstrual cycles. Um, so interesting, but likely unrelated. Okay. Um, and we've got a person here, some individuals 
um, experiencing some side effects after their first shot of the vaccine, lump in the throat, wheezing, you know, is that concerning? Should they go back for their second shot? What do you think? So there is always the potential to have a myriad of side effects uh, with any vaccine. The typical side effect profile is soreness of the arm at the injection site after the first vaccine. We're talking about the Pfizer and the Moderna. Um, and about typically, 22%. right, yep. uh, but the number of people who experience the viral symptomatology after the first dose was relatively small, about a third, somewhere between right. 25 and 35 percent. When you get the second dose, about 85 percent would experience not only the uh, muscle soreness of the arm, but would experience a viral symptomatology and can occur also with the single dose of the J&J. &J. Those viral symptoms are actually almost desired because what that means is that the immune system is working. It Absolutely. is seeing the spike protein. It's seeing the components of the virus that the vaccine is exposing the body to. And that response is the body saying, okay, that's not supposed to be here. Now I'm gonna ramp up my immune system to get rid of that. I'm gonna ramp up my immune system and develop antibodies. And when that happens, your lymph nodes are gonna get swollen. You may develop a sore throat. You may develop general state of malaise and fatigue and low grade fevers. That's all expected and almost desired. Now, whether or not you also then get a cold on top of that, that's likely just yeah. bad luck. Yeah. Well, I was one of those that got the severe symptoms, but I'm absolutely grateful, uh, you know, and, and really had the same thought in mind that as I felt it kind of, you know, left arm and, you know, going across my back and into the other side of my body and all of this fever, thinking, okay, your immune system is working. Now, by the way, that doesn't mean if you, if you don't get those kind of symptoms, it isn't working. Correct. It's just that some people get these robust, you know, fevers and chills and, and what have you. Mm -hmm. um, well, thank you. Someone, oh my goodness, thank you. Uh, there are folks out there thanking you for your service uh, during the pandemic. And, and I can only imagine what you, just again, just thinking about what you saw, what you experienced, the people that you cared for, the lives that you saved, we do thank you. Thank you, Dr. Weiss. Well, and it was I quite an amazing contribution. Thank the community for playing an important integral role and in trying to keep everybody safe by following guidelines and mandates. And it was hard and it was scary. And um, you know, we we were all a international team. Oh, absolutely. Well, let's take a couple more questions and then we'll head towards the end here. Um, it says here, for those of, that got the J&J &J vaccine, how concerned should they be about exposure to the COVID-19 variants? What do you, you know, think so, we'll all need a booster? <laughs> oh, I think we're all going to need a booster. Absolutely. Because what a virus does, yeah. it's, what it's meant to do is mutate. The fact that there are variants is not noteworthy. That is what it's meant to do. That's in its biology. Right. And so that variants exist is commonplace. And if we end up needing boosters to deal with those variants, I would expect that to be likely. It's the same thing that we do with influenza every year. The say. reason we get flu shots every year is because the flu virus- Is constantly. It's, it's uh, mutating. Absolutely. And variants exist. So um, you know the, the fact that we can try to target vaccines to the variants is actually very important. And those that still potentially can get, for instance, COVID on top of a vaccine, I have personal friends and colleagues who have gotten COVID despite being vaccinated, their symptoms are actually quite mild. And so if they were infected by a variant, it's not impossible to get sick, but the point of the vaccine is not to 100% of the time protect against COVID. The point of the vaccine is to protect you from the severe ramifications of COVID, mm -hmm. to keep you out of the hospital, to keep you off of a ventilator. We're not trying to prevent every cold. And so the vast majority of people who got COVID on top of a vaccine, possibly from a variant, um, did so in a very mild way. Absolutely. Um, does having COVID get, make you more susceptible to atrial fibrillation, that you know condition where the the smaller chamber starts to quiver mm -hmm. uh, in your heart. What, uh, what, do you, what are your thoughts about that? There are definitely arrhythmias that are seen more commonly with COVID. 
um, atrial fibrillation being one of them. Atrial fibrillation, as you mentioned, is an abnormal heart rhythm where the upper chambers of the heart no longer are coordinated with the bottom chambers of the heart and can create rapid and erratic rhythms and predispose people to blood clots that can lead to stroke. The whether it's the pro-inflammatory state or the state of illness, which can predispose one to bouts of atrial fibrillation, or whether it's specific to COVID, I don't think is necessarily borne out, but definitely atrial fibrillation is more likely related to COVID. Well, I think as we close, we have an opportunity to remind people about the signs and symptoms of mm -hmm. COVID. Um, it is diminished, uh, you know, massively diminished in the U.S., in other places around the world, in India, it's escalating, and other places, uh, you know, Southeast Asia are having some spikes in 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 uh, uh, in COVID, in in Europe, somewhat decreasing to to a large extent, and Latam is still dealing with with the crisis. Mm -hmm. So, what do we want to share with? What would you like to share with people in terms of, you know, what should they do? What sort of symptoms should drive them to getting a COVID test? Any upper respiratory symptoms may be COVID. Sometimes GI symptoms may be COVID. The loss of taste or smell may be COVID and it's actually a curious, it's a curious finding that that runs pretty closely with the diagnosis. Children will tend to have more GI symptoms and not necessarily respiratory symptoms, but that's still 20% of the time. In general, any sort of loss of taste or, or smell, upper respiratory symptoms, sore throat, cough, are important to consider a diagnosis of COVID. And when to be concerned about that diagnosis is when you start developing shortness of breath. The grades of severity from mild to moderate to severe really are partitioned based on your development of shortness of breath in a moderate person and then need for supplemental oxygen in a more severe case. And oh. so shortness of breath is really one where not only you should be tested, but seek medical care. Yeah. I, I'll share with you, and perhaps those of you out there listening will chuckle to hear this, my Saturday routine. It's a blood sugar, a, a finger stick for blood sugar. It's a pulse oximeter, uh, that little simple device you slip on your finger to see what your, uh, your, your O2 saturation is, uh, and my blood pressure check. Uh, and that's my Saturday routine before I start my errands just to make sure everything is okay. So if something was creeping up, but I think, you know, but that now that we can get out and walk about, I'm going to also make sure that I'm getting in my 10,000 steps. So I think that's something else that I need to pay a little bit more attention to. Dr. Weiss, thank you so much for your time pleasure. today. Really, I've learned a lot. I hope the audience has learned a lot. We learned a lot from the audience. We've got a couple articles coming, so I'll have to look into those. And, uh, uh, but, and, and for those questions that we couldn't answer, I will try to get back, either get an answer from Dr. Weiss or get, you know, post those on uh, Daryl uh, Darryl Roberts' uh, newsletter, which I hope everybody is reading, uh, his uh, weekly COVID-19 uh, newsletter. All right, so in terms of upcoming events from the American Heart Association, uh, we'll have our next fireside chat in July. Again, seven steps for achieving ideal cardiovascular health. And then please mark your calendars. I'm going to be there. I'm getting out the sneakers. I'm going to be, make sure that uh, I'm up to my 10,000 steps by then. Wilmington Heart Walk, November the 7th. Tubman Garrett River Walk, Riverfront Park in Wilmington. So uh, hopefully you'll be able to join, if not in person, then virtually. But let's make sure we're thinking about those things, uh, getting ready for the fall. We've got some beautiful summer days in front of us. Go out, get vaccinated. Let's get ready for these upcoming events. But everybody out there, thank you. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Really appreciate your time in joining with us today. We hope that this information has been helpful, helped you to think about uh, the importance of the heart as it's uh, related to COVID. I hope this inspires you to take care of yourselves and your families, and please consider getting a vaccination. Thanks so much. Take care. Be well.